right, so the title of my message, for those of you that are eight personalities like me that you need a title, <laughs> it's called The Power of Community. The Power of Community, amen? So I want you to look around this room, take a few seconds to just look around you, look at all these beautiful people that are sitting around you here. If you're online and you're watching and there's people with you, look around at them. This is your community. This is a community here of believers that God has given you. And you get to be a part of it, and you play an important part in this community. Every single person in this room has been set apart with a specific purpose. Amen? You're not an accident that was waiting to happen. You are not here because your mommy and your daddy look cute to each other. But God actually had a plan for your life. Wow. Can you believe God has a plan? Can you type in the chat, God has a plan? God has a plan for you. He has a plan for you. He has a plan for each and every one of us. God created you with the end in mind because he sees the end from the beginning. So that means he sees you in your best self. Amen. Every time he looks at us, he doesn't look at our mistakes he doesn't look at our shortcomings. He sees the perfect Lynn, and so does my husband, right, honey? <laughs> say yes, say yes. <laughs> he has a plan for your life, and I'm going to prove it to you. In Jeremiah 29, 11, you guys know this scripture. For I, this is the Lord speaking this over you. I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. They are plans to prosper you. I could use some prospering. Anybody want some prospering? Their plans to give you hope, their plans to prosper and not to harm you, plans to give you hope in a future. So if you don't have hope this morning, you came to the right place, amen? Because the God of hope, of all hope, is here, and he is the God that will give you exactly what you need. He wants to bless you. He wants to give you a great future. Now, because of that, if y'all think that's going to come easy, that it, it, the enemy's just going to let you have it, the Bible tells us that we have an enemy that contends against us, right? He is the enemy of our soul, and we know him as Satan. We know him as Lucifer, uh, the devil, the stinky devil, the liar, the father of lies. Because of everything that God has put inside each and every one of you, you have an enemy that wants to stop you from actually walking out your purpose and attaining what God has promised you, right? But how many know that he's not going to have his way? If you look to the end of your book, spoiler alert, the end of your Bible, we win, guys. So there you go. So he can try and he can lie to us and get us to believe the lies that, he, that somehow he has any kind of power over us, but we know where we are, whose we are. We are daughters and sons of the King of Kings. We are joint heirs with him. But this enemy, he's going to try it. You know, he's going to try us. He's going to try to worm his way in if we let him. So in 1 Peter 5, verse 8, God is telling us, hey, I need you to be alert. I need you to be vigilant. Because it says here, stay alert. Watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. He wants to derail us. He wants to destroy us. He wants to devour us. Now, he can only do it if we give him the room to do it because he has been defeated. There's no weapon that is formed against us that can prosper. Amen? So we have to be wise and we have to be watchmen to know, okay, we have an enemy, so let's be on guard and let's use our spiritual weapons to defeat him, right? Now, the reason that he wants to come against God's people is because, A, we are made in God's image. So when you see me, you see God. Amen? When you see each other, you see God. That's how we need to carry ourselves, that we represent the most high and that we make him look good in everything that we say and everything that we do, right? What we carry, there's a deposit in each and every person in this room, a deposit from God. You are pregnant, so congratulations. <laughs> you are pregnant. You're carrying the plan and the purpose of God for your life. God has put that already inside of you. Everything that you need to fulfill your purpose, he's already put it inside every single one of us. So because 
it's so valuable. We got to safeguard it, right? Now, when you have, let's say you have a lot of beautiful jewelry or you have a lot of money, you're not just going to leave that laying around, right? You're going to put it in a safe. You're going to password protect it, hopefully. You know, you may get yourself a little pit bull that'll help stay on guard with it, you know, or in our case, a little Brady that if you broke into my house, he'll let you take what you need. <laughs> He's not a guard dog. But we protect it, right? If it's valuable, we take care of it. We safeguard it. We don't just leave it out exposed. We want to make sure that nothing happens to it. It's important. So one of the reasons that, again, my message title is The Power of Community. One of the reasons we need community is because we need protectors for our promise. Protectors for our promise. So, of course, God helps to protect us, right? But we also need those people right here on earth with us that will help protect the thing that is so valuable that God has already put inside of us so that it can actually come to pass, so we can walk out our purpose, so it can come about. Amen? Godly friendships are the fortress for your destiny. We were never meant to walk alone, guys. And you know how why that's true? First of all, you see it in Genesis when God looks at Adam and goes, it is not good for man to be alone, right? And then what did Jesus do? Did Jesus walk out his purpose alone? No. So if Jesus felt like he needed his crew around him, what does that tell us? Aren't we imitators of Christ? So if we're imitators of Christ, that means we're not meant to walk alone either. We need our tribe. We need our crew. We need our relationships. We need our community because we are stronger together. In Deuteronomy 32, verse 30, it says, one can put a thousand to flight, but two can put 2,000, 10,000. Amen. I love God's math, man. I'm telling you, God's math is the best. <laughs> one, 1,000, two, 10,000. We're stronger together. What does that tell you about the power of unity, the power of walking in relationship, the power of community? This is why community is so powerful, because what we try to do on our own, by our own strength, our efforts could be multiplied if we partnered together with each other. See, Jesus knew that, and he knew that he had a purpose to walk out in the earth, and he still chose those 12 disciples to help walk out on his journey with him, to help walk out his purpose. Now, he was Jesus. He could have done it all by himself, but he wanted to show us the foundation of what he wanted us to do. He wanted to show us we were not meant to walk alone. He showed us we needed those purpose partners. Now, can I tell you that each and every person in this room, you are the purpose partner for somebody else's destiny. You have a responsibility to help walk alongside someone else to get them to their finish line. And guess what? God has given you that assignment because he knows that he can trust you. And he knows that you have everything inside of you to help them fulfill their destiny. He's called us not just to be purpose partners, but you know it's another way of looking at it? To be midwives for each other's promise. To help us birth something. And now, what is the definition of a midwife? A midwife is someone who brings into being. She brings, helps bring something into being. What is it that God has spoken about your life? You need a spiritual midwife that can help you bring that into being. Amen? And then you have the responsibility to be that spiritual midwife for someone else. Now, I want to talk to you about two midwives so that we can learn from their example how to be those purpose partners for people so that we can learn from their story how it is that we are to partner with birthing someone else's destiny. So let me give you the backstory. Before we read Exodus 1, 8 through 21, and it's a little chunk of scripture, but I promise you, you're going to get a lot out of it. Now, before this uh, scripture takes place, Joseph, you guys remember Joseph with the coat of many colors? 
So Joseph had favor. He was the right hand of the king of Pharaoh. He had the signet ring. He helped preserve the nation of Israel. So Joseph dies, and the Pharaoh that he was under dies. Now there's a new king in town, a new Pharaoh in town, and he don't even know who Joseph was. So Joseph had favor. The Israelites had favor while Joseph was in charge. Now that favor is gone. It's dead. And now you've got this mean Pharaoh who's heard of the prophecies that there will be a deliverer that will come and deliver the Israelites from out of his control. And he's like, I can't lose my workforce. Like, uh uh-uh, we got to do something about this. And this is where the story picks up. Exodus 1, verse 8 through 21. Then a new king to whom Joseph meant nothing came to power in Egypt. Look, he said to his people, These Israelites have become far too numerous for us. Come, we must deal shrewdly with them or they will become even more numerous. And if war breaks out, they will join our enemies, fight against us and leave the country. So they put these slave masters over them to like oppress them with forced labor. And they built Python and Ramesses as store cities for Pharaoh. This was all about Pharaoh. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and they spread. So the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites. They hated them. They're like, man, we can't take these people out. The more we get on them, the more they multiply. Something was wrong here. So they made their lives bitter with harsh labor and brick and mortar and with all kinds of work in the fields. In all the harsh labor, the Egyptians worked them ruthlessly. So the king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, the women that were the purpose partners, whose names were Shipra and Pua, when you are helping the Hebrew women during childbirth on the birth stool, remember that word, birth stool, if you see the baby is a boy, kill him. Why? Because there was a deliverer that was going to come, and it was a boy. Kill him. If it's a girl, let her live. How many girls in the room are like, oh, yeah, thank God I'm a girl. (laughs) So if it's a girl, let her live. The midwives answered Pharaoh. Hebrew women, now remember, the midwives were Hebrew. I don't know why I use quotes. They were were Hebrew people. (laughs) Um, And they're telling them, the Hebrew women that you're telling us to go and kill their boys, they are not like Egyptian women, like your women. They're throwing shade to Pharaoh now. (laughs) They are vigorous, and they give birth before the midwives arrive. So God was kind to the midwives, and the people increased and became even more numerous. And because the midwives fear God, he gave them families of their own. Now, in the olden days, if you were a midwife, you were a woman that couldn't have a child. So then you helped others deliver what you could not have. Now, here Pharaoh was the enemy of the Israelites, and he hears that this deliverer is about to come. And then he tells the women, he's like, okay, I need, I need a plan. I want you to go and find them when they are on the birth stool. Now, why didn't he tell them, go and tell us where the women are that are pregnant now, and then let's kill them now? Why didn't he say, okay, after the baby's completely out, that the baby's in the crib, go kill the baby, right? No. There was something specific about the birth stool, and I'm going to show you why. Put it right next to each other, honey. So the birth stool back in the day, welcome to the labor room of the olden days. Can you split it a little bit apart? Not too much. Thank you. Give me a gap in between. Okay, that's good. So if you were pregnant back in the day, this was your labor room. You had a birth stool. And it was a little higher than this, actually. But because I'm clumsy, y'all, I only put two bricks because I don't want to kill myself here. But... They literally would be propped up like this. Now, for us mamas that have had babies in the room, let me tell you something about labor. When you've labored for so long, 21 hours with my first one, you are wiped out. You're exhausted. And then let's add to that that you're bleeding. So what happens? You're exhausted. You're losing blood. Do you think you're a little vulnerable? You're at your most vulnerable state. So Pharaoh says, when they're propped up on that birth stool, when they can see that the promise is about to be birth, that's when I want you to go and kill them. They're vulnerable. They could barely hold themselves up. The midwives would come, 
and one midwife would be over here holding this arm. The other midwife would be over here. And the person here, come here one second, honey. Watch your head. The person, the, the woman that's pregnant, the woman that's pregnant would literally be like, no, you stand up. <laughs> You're holding me up. <laughs> the woman that's pregnant is literally like holding on like this, giving birth. She can't even hold herself up, guys. She needs his people, the midwives, to hold them up. So Pharaoh knew that they would be vulnerable. Pharaoh knew if they could see the promise, but they're not going to get to keep it. So he says, this is when I want the attack to happen, when they're vulnerable, where they have no strength to fight. That's when I want you to go and attack them. He wants to attack them at the birth stool when they're that close to holding their promise. But they're so weak that they could potentially give up. He sends the attack. That's how the enemy works, guys. He alienates us. He waits until we're vulnerable. He waits until we're weak. And that's when he launches the attack to see, will we remain on the birth stool or will we walk away from it? We're not going to let him win. So these midwives, one of the things that I love about these midwives, it says that they were Hebrew women, right? So Hebrew midwives sent to kill the babies of the Hebrew women. So they were part of the community. And as we read the story, it says, did the midwives do what Pharaoh told them to do? No. They literally would risk their lives saying no to a Pharaoh? Do you know what that could have cost them? But because they had built a community, because they had those people that they had linked arms with, they knew these are my people. My responsibility is to them. This is who God has called me to. He's called me to protect them. He's called me to take care of them. We are one. If you come against them, you come in against me. So they came. Pharaoh tried to get them against their own people, but they said no. And I love that because they protected. These midwives protect the promise of their fellow community, of their fellow sisters. Now, in order for us to walk into our purpose, we need each other, guys. Just like those, that woman needed those midwives, we need each other. I could tell you that many of us wouldn't be here today, myself included, had it not been for my community, had it not been for my sisters, my spiritual sisters that locked arms with me during difficult times, I wouldn't be here because the enemy is an opportunist. He's going to come when you're on that birth stool. That's when he's going to come. He's going to come when you're propped up that you're like, I've had six miscarriages. God said that I was going to have a child. How is this going to happen, Dolly? I don't know how this is going to happen. I'm your part promise partner. Don't worry. I'm not going to leave you alone. You're not alone. I'm with you, honey. Will God really do it, Dolly? He will. He will. We're going to unite in faith, and we're going to believe and trust God for you. Thank you, Jesus. I don't know. My marriage is on the rocks. I don't know what's going to happen with my marriage. I don't know, Denise. Can God resurrect this dead thing, Denise? I've tried. I've prayed. I've prayed. I've done everything that he's asked me to do. But yet my marriage is falling apart, Denise. Will God do it? I know this for sure. He never promised it would be easy. But he promised he would never leave you nor forsake you. And so I won't lie either. Thank you, Jesus. Okay. I think I have strength to push again. I think I'll push again. Will you hold me up? I will hold you up. I will hold you up. But guys, COVID is here. I lost my father just a few months ago. I didn't think that he would be taken. And now we've lost two more people. I don't know if I have this or what else am I going to lose. I don't know if I can believe I've lost hope. Don't ever lose hope. You know why? Because we will be right here with you every step of the way. I don't have the strength to pray, Denise. That's okay. I'll stand in the gap and I'll pray with you and for you. God said that he's close to the brokenhearted and those that are crushed in spirit. Jesus, you mean I can still walk it out? Yeah. I can still, pull, even when I don't have the strength, yeah. will you yeah. push with me? Yeah. purpose partners do they stand in the gap with you I can tell you that it's been purpose partners in my life that have helped me 
when I thought I didn't have the strength to push one more time. I remember being even on the birth stool having my oldest daughter, and I had hemorrhage. And I thought, literally, I was starting to faint, to pass away. And somebody held my arm, my husband on one side and my friend on the other side. And they began to speak life over me when I thought I couldn't do it anymore, when I thought I couldn't push anymore, when I had given everything that I had in my power. They poured faith back into me. They spoke life back into me. They held me up when I could not hold myself up. That's community, guys. That's relationship, guys. That's covenant relationship, guys. It's not the cute stuff going out for coffee. It's not the going out for dinner. It's when I'm hurting, I'm going to let you in. When I'm vulnerable, I'm going to let you see my mess. You're going to get to see my mess because you're in a covenant relationship with me. You get to see the blood. You get to see me at my worst because I can trust you that you have my good in mind and you're not going to take advantage of my vulnerability, but you're going to pour into me. You're going to speak life into me. You're going to resurrect in me whatever needs to be resurrected. God is going to fill their mouths their mouth to be able to speak life into me. That's what we need. We need covenant relationships. We need to speak life. We need people that will fight for us when we can't fight for ourselves. I've been there. Everything you heard me say, I went through. That was my testimony right there. And I had people like Denise, like Dolly and Freddie, like Jonathan, like Pastor Becky, that held my arms up when I couldn't hold my own arms up. That was my testimony. I had six miscarriages. I went through something in my marriage, and God resurrected our marriage. And if he can do it, but let me tell you, it wasn't easy. There were times I wanted to get off the birth stool and walk away. And they had to remind me of what God spoke over our life. No, this is not who you are, Lynn. Get up. You put your war clothes on. You're going to fight. Let me tell you who you are. Let me tell you what God has spoken about your life. This is what he's calling you. Don't let the enemy strike you on the birth stool. But get up again. Push again. Hope again. Dream again. Come on. Pray again. Speak life even over yourself again. We need those types of relationships because we can't walk alone. We were never intended to walk alone. But this is important. This is life-giving, guys. This is life-giving. This is not a relationship that's going to suck from you. This is not a relationship that's going to smile in your face and then when you give your back, something else is different. But this is a relationship that knows you so well. They know the good. They know the bad, and they love it all. That's the kind of friendships that we need. That's real community, amen? That's the covenant relationships. The, the, the Moses had Aaron and her who held up the, his arms. And every time that the Moses' arms started to go down, they started to lose the battle. But when Moses, Aaron and her came, those spiritual midwives, those purpose partners came, and they pull up the arms of Moses, they won the victory over the enemy. Amen. Together we win. Together, we're stronger. We need each other. Thank you, Lord. They're going to help us push when we want to give up. That's the power. It will keep us. You know what those relationships do? That community, that real community, that real relationship, it helps keep us from aborting our promise. Because just like many times I wanted to get off the birth stool, and it, the pain is always the strongest right at the minute that the promise is about to be birthed. And so many of us give up in that moment when what we need to do is push one more time. I don't know who needs to hear this today, but God is calling you today not to get off the birth stool. God is calling you today to push one more time. Bear down in the spirit. 
and push it through. You're about to give birth. Don't quit. Don't give up. We need each other, guys. Those relationships, listen, it takes work to build those covenant relationships. But I don't know about you. I could testify it's worth it. Is it worth it? It's worth it. It's so worth it. So how do we build those relationships that are going to stand in the birth stool with us, that are going to stand in those dark moments with us? How do we build that type of community? Well, let me tell you, sometimes it's as easy as even, not as easy, but the first step is like even we have small groups. Why do you think that pastors want small groups? They don't need another thing to do. That's not the purpose of a small group. It's not to keep you guys busy. It's because they recognize what I shared with you earlier, that Jesus didn't walk alone. And they don't want you and I to walk alone. They want us to partner with each other. And so they're trying to make a place of connection for you so that you can connect to a community, so that you can build relationships, so that when those birthstool moments come, you've already done the work to build a relationship, and now you have your purpose partners by your side. Thank you, Lord. How do we build that community? Well, number one, what did we learn from the midwives? The Bible said the midwives feared God. That means that God was who they honored. God was who they served. God was in the center of everything that they did. In spite Pharaoh being the king and the authority over them, they understood they had a higher authority than Pharaoh, and that was God. And they were going to honor God. God has to be in the center of our relationships. Because when God is not in the center, that's how you end up having relationships that hurt each other. And they walk away, and they don't know how to engage because they haven't put God in the middle. But the midwives honored God. We need relationships where we are going to, you know what we're going to do, guys? Hashtag no filter. We're going to take off the masks. We're going to be vulnerable and transparent and real with each other. We're going to let our guard down. Yeah, could you be hurt? Yes. But could you also miss out on something great? Yes, you can. So I want to just encourage you, let down your guard. Let people into your life. Let them see who you really are. Let the right people into your, your life, into partnership with you. Let's be transparent because you know what? We don't know how to pray if you don't let us in. How do we know well, how to pray effectively if you're not letting us in? Those relationships, we need to love and protect each other. Just like the midwives, you know what they did? They basically stood in the gap. Pharaoh said, attack them. They're like, nope, not on my watch. It's not going to happen. Oh, no, you're not taking this person out. You got to go through me to get to them. That's the kind of vulnerability. We need to love each other and protect each other. Love conquers a multitude of sins. Amen? We got to be there to hold each other up. So that means not just in the good times, but in the mess, in the bad times. And you know what? It's important for us to speak life over each other, to speak the word, because there are many things that we could say over each other, but when we speak the living, breathing word of God over each other, that's a river of living waters that will flow into the person when they need it the most. And we have power in our tongue. Life and death are in the power of the tongue. So let's speak life. You know, what I love about this is, and I'm going to have the worship team come up, that these midwives, remember I told you the midwives were women that couldn't have babies, and so they were assigned the role to help others. Since they couldn't do it, they would help others do it. But look at what happened. Because of the relationships that they had built, they protected the promise of another, and what did they get in return? What they sowed, they reaped. Do you mean that God's principle of sowing and reaping is accurate? What you sow, you reap. So I want to encourage you. What is it that you need God to do for you? What is the thing that you're believing God to do? Will you step out boldly in faith and sow that into someone else and watch how you shall reap? These midwives reaped families of their own. God blessed them with children of their own as they stood in the gap for someone else. Amen. That breakthrough that you've been praying for, maybe it's tied for you being that midwife to someone else, for you standing in the gap 
for another. We're each other's destiny keepers. That's the power of community. And we got to be intentional. We can't wait for the other person to initiate. You know what? It goes both ways. We pick up the phone. If they're not calling, we call. If they're not texting, we text. If they're not inviting themselves over to your house, you invite themselves over to their house. I've done it. <laughs> I'm like, I'm coming over to your house after church, okay? I like coffee. <laughs> like, that, we've got we've to develop that. We can't be shy. We can't be afraid of rejection because we're missing out. We've got to do it. So I'm just going to ask you if you could stand with me today. I want to pray with you today. I recognize that. Just as I was talking about the birth stool today and how when we're so vulnerable, we're so weak, there could be somebody watching today or somebody in this room that maybe your strength is failing you today. Can I tell you the God of all hope is here. The God of strength. When we are weak, he is strong. He is here today. He is in the room today. We're going to pray for you. If that's you and you're watching online, I want you to put a raised hand because we have prayer warriors that are waiting to pray for you right now. You're in the room today. Maybe you feel like, God, I don't know. There's things that have happened that I don't know if they're going to come to pass, God. I'm at the point of giving up. I've lost too much. I don't see how this could happen, Lord. It seems impossible. God, I don't even have the strength to fight. I don't even have the strength to pray anymore. That's okay. We're here. We're here to pray over you. We're here to speak life over you. We're here to be spiritual midwives for you today. You're not alone. The devil is a liar. God brought you to the right place at the right time with people that are spirit-filled that will speak life into your spirit. That you have a community of believers that is here to stand with you today. Don't walk out the same when you don't have to. Allow us to pray over you. There's power in prayer, guys. There's power in the laying on of hands. There's an impartation that happens. If you can't pray for yourself, we'll pray for you. We're here for you. And we're going to open up this altar. And what that means is that if you want prayer, I would love the honor to be able to pray for you. And we can pray privately. It doesn't have to be a loud thing, but I would love to pray for you. Lord, I can just ask you to close your eyes for a second. Lord, we just come before you right now, Lord God. Father, and I just speak over every person that is here today, Lord God. Father, as we get ready to worship, Lord God, we just want to lift up every person that walked in weary today, Lord God, that walked in feeling like they were hemorrhaging, that walked in feeling like they didn't have enough strength, that walked in wondering, God, are you there? Are you hearing me, Lord? That walked in feeling alone and forgotten, Lord God. Lord, we just want to pray your strength, Lord God. I silence the lies of the enemy in the name of Jesus. He is an opportunist that wants to get us alone, but we are not alone, Lord God, because you are with us, Lord God. You go before us. You go beside them, Lord God. So I pray strength right now in Jesus' name. I pray, Lord Father, that every lie is silenced in Jesus' name. Lord, I pray, Lord, for just a spiritual bearing, Lord God, that they would bear down in the spirit once more and lean in and push in, Lord God, and believe that you are not a man that you should lie, that if you said it, you will do it. You watch over your word to protect it, Lord. So I thank you. I speak life over every hearer today. In Jesus' name, strength will go back into their bodies today. Hope will go back into their spirits today. Joy will be their portion today. New hope in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord.